Today I'm going to talk a little bit about what I saw around the world and try to bring it back to Edmonton towards the end. First though, I'm here to tell you that I'm a strap hanger and I'm proud to be one, but I better explain what that means. I'm going to just check my slides here. Here's some typical strap hangers in New York. This picture was taken by Stanley Kubrick, by the way, when he was 18 years old. I better explain what that means. Strap hanger is an old term. They still use it in London and New York to describe a user of public transportation. Somebody who's crammed onto a Paris metro car, a London double-decker bus, or a Hong Kong ferry, usually forced to stand and hold a strap. I have a somewhat broader definition. For me, being a strap hanger can mean being a cyclist and a pedestrian, because in many cities, bicycles are a form of mass transportation, and every ride on a bus or a subway or a light rail car begins and ends on foot. Being a strap hanger, once again, according to my personal definition, means you don't rely on a private automobile for your day-to-day -day transportation. I've managed to reach my late 40s without ever owning a car, which is something of a feat in North America. Of course, I use cars, I've even worked as a professional driver once, delivering dentures around the lower mainland in Vancouver. I still uh, make sure my driver's license is paid up every year and I belong to a car share program. But for 95% of my travel, I go by foot, train, my own bicycle or bike share, or because I live in Montreal, the subway, the, or the metro as they call it in Montreal. It's a city I chose to live in, by the way, in large part because it's highly walkable and bikeable and transit friendly. For some people, the fact that I ride transit and don't own a car makes me one pathetic individual. <laughs> now that quote's from Salvador Dali. I've been to his uh, castle in Catalonia and seen his old collection of Cadillacs. But look what I found. Here's Salvador Dali coming out of what is clearly a Paris metro station. He's a surrealist, so he's walking his pet aardvark, of course, but still busted <laughs> Dali on transit. Another well-known commentator uh, set the loser bar even lower. That's a quote that's been attributed to Maggie Thatcher. The closest I could come to finding her on a bus is this. <laughs> Good call, London Transit. <laughs> it's not her, of course, it's Meryl Streep. The real Iron Lady would never have been caught dead on transit. As far as I'm concerned, elitist snobs like them can keep their chauffeured limousines. A few years ago, I decided to embrace the maligned identity of the strap hanger for a book I was working on. I set out on a round-the-world trip looking at the best and worst in urban transportation and interurban transportation. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little about what I saw along the way. First of all, I've got to give you a small lecture. It'll be short. Why do our cities need more and better public transit? Simply put, Private automobiles no longer work as a form of mass transit in our cities. Transport Canada estimates that collisions alone, accidents, cost our economy $63 billion, or crashes is actually the, the term of art these days. If you throw in air pollution, carbon emissions, and delays from traffic congestion, cars cost another $27 billion. And what do we get for that $90 billion? You're not experiencing so much in Edmonton yet, but it's already hit Toronto and Montreal where the journeys to work every day are 80 minutes. Some of the worst in North America and Europe. We're, I think, 19th and 20th out of 20. Or actually, we're close to the top in being worst. As a bonus, we're paying through the nose to kill ourselves. Our chosen transportation technology, the private automobile, kills 1.3 million people around the world every year about two to 3,000 in Canada. In the few minutes I've been talking to you so far, 12 people have had their lives cut short by cars around the world. At the same time, the cost, both to our pockets and to the environment of car use, keeps going up. After electricity generation, automobiles are the single largest man-made contributors to climate change, accounting for about 10% of greenhouse gases. Electric cars might provide some hope, and I was initially enthusiastic about them, if half the electricity on this continent didn't come from burning coal, which means that a continent-wide fleet of leafs and volts would be a global warming disaster. But for me, the real big issue is that the future of the world is urban. Half the Earth's population already lives in cities. We reached that landmark just a couple of years ago. And by mid-century, the proportion will be closer to three quarters which means a global urban population of 6.4 billion. 
What's more, the growth rate is accelerating. Your cities now grow by 1.5 million people a week, um, which means that a city the size of New York is added to the world's population every two months now. The simple reality is that no matter how small we make the cars, whether we make nanos in India or little micro cars here, how many triple-decked highways we built, cars are just not going to fit into the mega cities of the future. There's Shanghai. I was there recently. They, they have a lot of cars there. But look at this. Beijing on any one day. Moscow on a good day. Not too bad. Hyderabad on any given day in India. That, in short, is my argument for transit. Not that it's noble to ride it or always pleasant. Far from it. It's because it's the only thing that's going to keep people moving in the cities of the future. All right, end of lecture. Let's get on to the fun stuff. I'm not what you'd call a train spotter. I'm not really a rail fan, but I do consider urban rail one of the great pleasures of life and travel. And one of the greatest things I saw in my travel and one of the most interesting things I saw was modern European trams. They're an example of transit glamour, which shows that I guess I am enough of a nerd to make a slide like this. <laughs> Whoops, oh god. There we go. So these are mod uh, an example of a modern, they call them trams. These are low floor streetcars, or LRTs. Uh, Toronto's going to have some of these, and I think you will too. The French city of Strasbourg has largely banished cars from its historic center while making cheap and uh, frequent tramways like these the de facto mode of transit. On one Saturday afternoon during my visit, I was amazed to see the way that these tramways delivered people downtown. Now, initially, City Hall and the local merchants wanted to build a subway system. Instead, they ended up investing in these great low-floor streetcars, which allow shoppers with strollers and wheelchairs to board easily. Here's another one I saw just coming out of the train station in uh, Montpellier. There are now 20 cities in France with major modern tram systems. Toronto has added, I think it's a 200 Flexity Outlook trams to its fleet, uh, pretty similar to the ones I'm showing you here. That's going to be a fantastic gain in comfort and mobility for riders, but it's not going to have the same kind of effect that it's had in European cities. Because what places like Strasbourg and Montpellier, Bordeaux, and Clermont-Ferrand have done is give almost all the downtown street space over to the trams. In other words, they've kicked out almost all the cars. Not surprisingly, this increases the speed and efficiency of the trams. Here's how they kind of, the one in Clermont-Ferrand fits in. The one in Clermont-Ferrand is really cool because that's uh, the town that Michelin is from. They operate on rubber tires, so they're very quiet on a single guideway. The small business people I talked to in Strasbourg loved the trams and told me they'd never go back to the days when their customers had to come by car. Incidentally, people park on the outskirts of town in rather cheap lots and then ride the trams in to do their shopping. Uh, and the price of parking downtown is a lot higher than the ride of a full week of like tram rides. They've seen for themselves how a tram system, properly implemented and run, delivers far more people far more efficiently to their shop doors than cars ever could. When I travel in the east, I go by train to Toronto, Ottawa, and Quebec City. I love the ride. I love the way it brings me from downtown to downtown with fewer emissions. On a good day, if we're not sidelined by a freight train, getting Toronto to, from Montreal takes about five hours at an average speed of 98 kilometers an hour, which isn't bad until you remember, as some of you might, in the 1970s, Canada had a great train, the jet-nosed turbo train. It could do the same trip in three hours and 59 minutes. Uh, it was operated by Canadian National. It had a gas turbine locomotive that on one test run topped out at 275 kilometers an hour, which was then a world record. While Canada's dropped the ball on high-speed trains, the rest of the world has been charging ahead. Earlier in the summer, I went to Italy. And when I was there, I rode Europe's fastest high-speed train. I didn't really seek it out. I just wanted to go from Rome to Naples. It's called the Freccia Rossa Mila, the red arrow. On my ride, it topped out at 300 kilometers an hour. It's capable of 360. We did the 225 kilometers between Rome and Naples in one hour and nine minutes. 
That's a comparable distance to between, uh, between Calgary and Edmonton, by the way. At that rate, we, you could do Toronto to Montreal in two hours and 20 minutes with no airport transfer, no security. Here's the kicker. The company that makes the Freccia Rosa is Bombardier, the Canadian company. <laughs> And in this country, our trains continue to limp along at a maximum speed of 160 kilometers an hour, achieved usually only for very short distances. We're the only G8 country that doesn't have a single kilometer of high-speed rail. Thailand is building high-speed rail. Turkey has just opened a high-speed rail tunnel under the Bosphorus. Even the US has the Asela, which does okay. There's no reason that there shouldn't be high-speed rail in Canada in the Windsor to Quebec City corridor, and I'd argue between Calgary and Edmonton. Redirecting the federal subsidies that currently go to passenger aviation in that corridor in particular to high-speed, low-carbon emission rail would be one of the most far-sighted things the federal government could do. For me, intercity trains, and this is why I'm talking about them, are a crucial, oh, by the way, this is what you do when you're in the train. You watch the screen and watch the numbers gradually mount, mount up and try to get the 300. I almost got it. <laughs> As anybody who's ridden the passenger rails in Europe or Asia knows, when trains mesh seamlessly with urban rail systems, a car-free life becomes possible. It even becomes the norm. Now for me, there's nothing as glamorous as a big city subway system. I've long loved Paris's metro. That was the one I lived there in the 90s that taught me to love mass transportation. And London's underground has its kind of smoky charms. But on this trip, the one that blew me away was Naples metro. Not for the trains, but for the stations. So last time I was in Naples, it was totally chaotic when I arrived at the main train station. This time, all of a sudden, they built this wonderful station. 13 stations in the system were handed over to artists under the direction of a former curator of the Venice Biennale. He wanted to create what he called an obligatory museum. I like that phrase. One that would lead strap hangers through catacombs of beauty. <laughs> this is the Toledo station, which is one of the most spectacular ones. It starts with these beautiful murals, tile murals. And then you ride escalators through this sort of breathtaking tiled ceiling. As you go down, you look up that sort of spout there and it goes all the way up to street level. You can see the sunshine. Um, at the bottom, you walk along this interactive seascape by the American artist Bob Wilson. As you walk along, you're deep underground, but this waves start moving, so it feels like you're walking along the beach. I explored the system with my, uh, there's also, I don't know why they did this. There's a, like an oral side to the whole thing. There's a cosmic ray detector in the station. So as you're going down to these strange chords, that are activated by the play of uh, cosmic rays in the sky up above. It's quite eerie. I explored the station with my uh, three-year-old son, Desmond, who was uh, quite enthusiastic about some of this is the university station. Quite psychedelic in some parts, 60s <laughs> pop arty. <laughs> he loved it. Here's another example of a truly spectacular metro system. Anybody guess where that is? You got it. Could be Pyongyang, it could be Kiev. There's sort of a, a similarity between a lot of these uh, Stalinist metro stations. <laughs> Systems, once you, get, once you get to know them. But this is the original. This one is Komsomolskaya. Pardon my pres uh, pronunciation. To me, it kind of looks like Liberace's uh, basement ballroom. <laughs> <laughs> if it had been decorated like, by master propagandists. <laughs> Most stations have these huge zalls, that's the zall, and the trains are on either side, which you reach by taking very long, very fast wooden escalators. The, Mos the Moscow Metro was explicitly conceived as a way of elevating the everyday citizen. It's transit with a thes thesis, and one of the few systems that has splendor engineered right into it. For me, of course, the fact that it was largely built with close to slave labor or very poorly paid and poorly housed labor does detract from the achievement. But Muscovites, I've discovered, are incredibly fond of their old Stalinist metro. Here's the uh, Dostoevskaya station, which is one of the new stations, dedicated to the great writer. How'd you like that on a February morning? <laughs> Dostoevsky glowing at you at the end of the platform. It's probably the only transit stop, well, certainly the only transit stop in the world that whose official decor features a nihilist axe murdering <laughs> his landlady. <laughs> in both Naples and Moscow, 
where high levels of car ownership, Naples has the highest in Europe, mean that the streets above are often paralyzed with gridlock. Subways mean citizens can count on getting to work and school and home and comfort and dignity with a significant amount of beauty thrown in along the way. Now, in my travels, I also saw lots of examples of poorly conceived transit. Transit that looks cool and shiny and sexy, but doesn't really do much. Transit fails, if you will. Here's one. It's a Sydney monorail. I couldn't believe this thing existed. It was so Disney. If snakes are used to snake between the skyscrapers and the central business district and around Darling Harbor, operating in a one-way loop. If stations were hard to reach, the tickets were expensive, and the thing was molasses slow. I remember it was about five bucks for a little ride. Rarely intersected with buses and commuter trains. Fortunately, Sydney realized how useless it was, and last year they tore it down. For me, the Sydney monorail, like Las Vegas's bankrupt monorail, or Detroit's poorly implemented version of SkyTrain technology, are nothing more than glorified people movers, like the ones you see in Disneyland. What a city that's really serious about keeping itself moving has to do is think hard about the kind of transit mode that best fits its urban form. Example I really like is this little town. I keep on coming back to Italy. I'm becoming a, an Italophile, I guess. It's uh, Perugia's Mini Metro. At first glance, this looks like another Disney-style people mover. But it's actually a form of transit that's ideally suited to the little hill town it serves. Perugia used to be besieged by tourists and automobiles and tour buses during its summer festivals. It decided to solve the problem by closing its medieval center to traffic, except for local residents, at the same time building this cable-driven mini-metro. The driverless cars you see can carry up to 25 people. A new one comes along every 90 se seconds. They're incredibly frequent. They trundle along dozens of long kilometers of track at a pretty respectable speed, 26 kilometers an hour. Local people use it for shopping, and getting to school and work, as a bonus, the Mini Metro has, by removing cars from the street in the center, revived the great Italian tradition of the passeggiata, where people just pour into the street between five and seven and go for a nice stroll without having to look over their shoulders to see if a car is gonna hit their strollers. Another example of unusual but successful transit is the mid-levels escalators in Hong Kong. These are 20 linked escalators. It's a significant transit system. They go down in the morning and up in the afternoon, passing apartments and 7-Elevens and, and bubble tea shops. The only time they don't run is during typhoons. Here's how they're integrated into the, the city. When I came across the system, I was astonished. I got on one escalator, and all of a sudden, I was born up into uh, up in the mid-levels of Hong Kong. It's really cool. You can see this in some of the films of uh, the great uh, Hong Kong filmmaker, uh, Wong Kar Wai, where people are just in apartments, and people are going past their windows on escalators. It's like, what the, where the hell is that? <laughs> uh, there's another example of this in the world. It's called the Medellin Mega Escalator which has turned an arduous 30-minute walk, the equivalent of a 28-story building for residents of this poor uh, area in, uh, in Medellin, into a five-minute ride. I'm showing you these because they're solutions that are uniquely suited to Hong Kong and Medellin's morphology and density. What I want to say here is that transit isn't always about subways or buses or light rail. It's about mobility. It's about getting around the city. But mobility has to be matched with artistry and imagination to the city you're bringing it to. If you're looking for bang for your transportation buck, sometimes slamming a billion dollar rail project on a city isn't the way to go. So people tell me not everybody lives in a not pretty cute little Italian hill town or a hyper dense Asian city. In North America, it's been estimated that 45% of the population lives in central cities small towns or older suburbs that can at least, in theory, be effectively served by transit. However, by area, 80% of metropolitan areas, metropolitan areas in this continent are suburban in character. And a lot of them, especially in the West and American South, look like this. That's an extreme example, admittedly. You'll notice all the loops and lollipops, the lollipops on six sticks, this is what urbanists call these street forms, the cul-de-sacs. <clears throat> it's a landscape that's singularly resistant to transit. Buses tend to circulate empty or nearly empty in such a landscape. 
Many people believe that these neighborhoods will change in decades to come, and that's possible. Multifamily dwellings will slowly be added to the, the landscape of single-family homes. Big box stores and strip malls will be repurposed, making these neighborhoods denser. There's a whole movement called sprawl repair that's trying to change this relatively low density landscape. Now Edmonton is a really interesting case. It's a city that has always shown strong support for transit. And for much of its early history, it was actually built around transit. Its street railway network up until the 50s was extensive. You even had this great uh, streetcar bookmobile. Whoops. Which shows you that the Edmonton Public Library has been at the cutting edge for a long, long time. <laughs> I saw your, the, this great book dispensing machine at the Century Park Station the other day. Fantastic idea. But they were bringing books out to kids in far-flung suburbs back in the 40s and 50s. There's even a Paramount newsreel you can find on YouTube that, uh, that shows that this was considered a, a fantastic innovation, important enough to bring uh, the attention of the world back then. Um, you also have the High Levels Bridge, you have your Radial Railway Society, you have your Transit Enthusiasts, which is fantastic, and you have a reputation for being a source of transit innovation. People scoff when I say that, but in the 1960s, Transit Superintendent Don McDonald was the first in Canada and the United States to introduce a pulse transit system, a hub and spoke system, where buses met up at transit centers and left at all about the same time. This was an innovation back in the 60s. And in 1978, of course, you all know this, you introduced the LRT well before Vancouver or Toronto. Thanks to the LRT, which now attracts 100,000 rides a day, and with the new line, it's likely to attract more, you have actually have excellent levels of transit ridership. It's about 13% of trips in the metro area. Contrast that with Saskatoon, where the figure is 4%. The Canadian average is about 12%. So you've already got a great amount of public buy-in, but there's a lot of improvements you can make as well. Much of what is uh, now central Edmonton used to consist of streetcar suburbs. And I'm grateful for the guys at Spacing for letting me use this slide. This shows you, <clears throat> this is a, a map of the network in 1950. It was even more extensive in 1938. It had contracted a little bit. But you can see that a lot of the city was within a five minute walk of a streetcar line in red. Places like Oliver, Glenora, Strathcona, Westmount, Belgravia, Highlands, Bonnie Dune, Garneau. You note that the streets in the area are built on a grid pattern, which is excellent for transit. In my opinion, you can make huge gains in transit ridership by increasing frequency with buses in these areas. They're the low-hanging fruit. In short, Edmonton has a lot of strengths you can build on when it comes to transit. At the moment, though, you may be spreading it a little bit thin. You've got a huge metropolitan area. It's 9,426 square kilometers. There's a case to be made, I think, for increasing frequency in the neighborhoods that were built around transit in the first place. Anyways, this is a discussion that I'm going to leave to you, and I hope what I'm talking about today will help spur the discussion on. But it is a decision you have to make. What level is going to go to serving the entire metropolitan area, and what level is going to go to building frequency and perhaps ridership in the core? Anyways, and to bring you back to Edmonton, and we'll have some questions and answers afterwards where I can talk more about this. I'm a big fan of light rail. I'm delighted you're building more here, in spite of the problems it's experiencing at the moment. Given how spread out Edmonton is, though, light rail is never going to serve the whole city. It provides a great spine. In the meantime, buses are probably going to have to do a lot of the heavy hauling. In my travels, I discovered one place where they were successfully grappling with the problem of matching efficient bus service to urban form. I'd like to talk to you about one of the most successful, Bogota in Colombia. A couple of visionary mayors, including Enrique Peñalosa, launched a system called Transmillennio. Oh, I wanted to show you that. This is another nice idea that maybe to consider on some of the outer parts of Edmonton, heated bus stops. <laughs> I was surprised they had them in Fort Murray. They, Fort McMurray, they actually have quite high transit ridership there, or they did when I was there last year. And uh, Calgary has some too. You press a button and this blast of hot air goes up. 
It's a great idea. I've waited for buses in the Alberta winter, and uh, if you can minimize that weight and make it more comfortable, God bless you. Anyways, back to Transmillennial, a true bus rapid transit system which relies on fast loading, articulated buses running in dedicated lanes. They operate like subways on the street. People pay before they get on, that's crucial. There are platforms with multiple doors that slide open when the bus pulls abreast, so people just shuffle on like they were getting onto an elevator. There are express buses that skip stations, like on the New York subway, and up to half a dozen buses can be loading and unloading at a station at one time. That's how they're integrated into the city. Those are the platforms uh, where there are boardings on either side. Some of the big buses, the B-Articulados, are as long as the 737 and can carry 270 passengers. Transmillennio achieves the heavy hauling capacity of a subway at a fraction of the cost. It also revolutionized transportation in a city that relied on a chaotic system of private busetas, which turned most streets into gridlock parking lots. When I visited, the system was overcrowded, and there was talk of building a subway. It's a big city. It's a city of 8 million. But most Bogotanos I talked to favored expanding and improving Transmillennio. A crucial aspect of the system, and why I think it's applicable to cities like Edmonton, is the way that these heavy hauling buses mesh seamlessly with little green feeder buses, much smaller buses, half-sized buses, that go into the far-flung suburbs. And the way they mesh with the heavy hauling buses, the red ones or yellow ones I showed you, is in fair paid areas. So you just get off one bus and get off the other without, uh, get on the other, which takes you home without having to show proof of pay, uh, payment. That's the Bogota model. Run a network of small buses with high frequencies, so transfers are easy, feeding into a heavy hauling subway, bus rapid transit, or light rail system. It's simple, fast to implement, and applicable to North American cities. All right, let's move on to another mode, if you've got the patience. Light rail, which you're familiar with here in Edmonton. I'll t I need to tell you a tale of two cities when it comes to light rail. Both have made significant investments in light rail, but only one has turned that investment into a success. Uh, I don't have the slide for it here. Yes, I do, good. This is Phoenix's light rail system, Metro. The city built itself 30 kilometers of light rail lines at a cost of 1.4 billion American. They're Japanese-made, spacious, air-conditioned, lovely, cutting-edge rail technology. So why does light rail fail in Phoenix while it succeeds in places like Strasbourg and Portland and Calgary? For one simple reason. Phoenix is a city that was formed almost completely after the coming of the automobile. They've done nothing to change the simple arithmetic of sprawl. There's only the smallest of walking cities at the center and only one of the most limited historical transit suburbs, nothing like Edmonton, which means the light rail trains spend most of their time rumbling past surface parking lots and cacti and even tumbleweeds. Don't get me wrong, I love the experience of riding on Metro, but this kind of transit, as nice as it is, is spectacularly ill-suited to a city like Phoenix. The evidence is in the ridership, which is really low. I think Phoenix is about the fifth or the sixth largest city in the United States, and they get a, a third of the boardings of Edmonton's light rail a day. A city that I'm excited about is Denver, Colorado. They're busy expanding their existing light rail system into a 10-line light rail and commuter rail network. When the program, which is called Fast Tracks, is done, they'll have a system which whisks people along at a top speed of 130 kilometers an hour, taking them from the airport to this beautiful century-old Union Station. They've just built this, this new platform outside the station. That's the Amtrak station. So the trains bring you in from the airport, and then they mesh up with express buses and light rail lines that go all through the region. It's a 6,000 square kilometer uh, metro region. Though Denver is a sprawled western city, the regional transportation district, which is one of the largest landowners in the state, is significantly increasing density around stations. In the Union Station area, a whole new neighborhood has emerged with multifamily buildings in the four to eight story range and condo towers up to 21 stories. So you can see some of the smaller multifamily buildings right next, within walking distance, of the light rail stations. <clears throat> they have huge public buy-in. Fast Tracks is being funded with a sales tax increase, which works out to four cents on most $10 purchases. They've raised $7.8 billion that way. 
Now they've got something working for them. Congestion is bad enough that Americans in many cities are now voting to tax themselves to build better rail transit. Here's a slide of the commuter rail platform. It's beneath the airport. It's actually been completed. So you get right off the plane. There's a Marriott Hotel on the top. There's a swimming pool in sort of the arch of the saddle there. So you can get right off your plane, and like in an Asian city, get to the center of this American city at a speed of 130 kilometers an hour. Uh, the frequencies are going to be fabulous, by the way. 10 minutes on a lot of these things between trains. The difference between Denver and Phoenix is that, and here's a map of the system, which is pretty extensive. <clears throat> the difference between Denver and Phoenix is that Denver has given a lot of thought to changing the morphology, the form of the city, specifically by increasing density around light rail stations. Phoenix, on the other hand, has done very little to build density, which means ridership remains low, and the trains spend much of their times, time running empty. It's only when you get the density formula right that rail really makes sense. In the end, by the way, I consider myself an agnostic on this matter. Buses, rail, whatever works. I'm not, I don't pump for either form. In Canada, Kitchener-Waterloo is doing something very interesting. By 2017, this region of half a million residents will be opening a 36-kilometer light rail line with 22 stations. They'll be operating surface-running new generation streetcars, probably like the ones we'll see here. And there's one on display. They're just showing it to the, to the people there. At the, time, uh, they're at the same time, they're opening a bus rapid transit system, which in phase two will be converted to a second light rail line. Good idea. It's going to cost eight, uh, $818 million. The money comes from the feds, the, uh, the province, and the region. And they're also funding it with an increase in uh, property taxes, which works out to about $11 per household. They're building in Kitchener-Waterloo, the home of Research in Motion, the Perimeter Institute, where Stephen Hawking has an office, two leading universities, large college. It's a place that attracts international talent. And they want people, especially families, to stay there in the long term, which means they want to build places where people can stroll, places that feel urban, that have year-round street life. They don't want to build more malls, more highways. Like Denver, they're planning for transit-oriented development, a key word, around the stations. In other words, they're not just thinking about transportation, they're thinking about city building. Of course, building transit that works takes a lot of money. We all know that. It's an enormous investment for any city. But it takes far less money than it takes to build new roads and freeways, or new ring roads, which we know and have known for a long time just don't work as a solution to gridlock. <laughs> Anybody recognize that? I bet you guys recognize it. Who is that? The great Lewis Mumford one of my urbanism gurus, along with Jane Jacobs. Uh, in the 20th century, they were, here's a picture of him, by the way, looking like a, a young Pierre Trudeau <laughs> in a buckskin jacket about to go. I don't know why they put him like that on the cover of Time magazine. It's nice there's an urbanist on the cover of Time magazine, though. In the 20th century, him and James Jacobs were among the first to warn us that if we continued to build cities around the needs of cars rather than people, we were heading down a road to ruin. Now listen, I'm a realist. I live in the real world, believe it or not. I don't think cars are going to go away anytime soon. They're very useful machines. I'm the first to acknowledge it. Even cities that have seriously limited their use still rely on them in some form or another. But there's a lot of evidence that car use in North America is going the way it's already gone in Japan and Northern Europe. People there may own cars, but they use them for weekend trips to the country, visits to the in-laws, or picking up furniture at one of those Swedish big box stores on the edge of town rather than for day-to-day -day commuting, which is the key difference. Here's why I'm convinced the future belongs to people like us, the strap hangers. As the baby boomers retire, some of them are downsizing, opting out of square footage in the suburbs for condos downtown, or even homes in walkable downtowns. More importantly, though, the boomers are now outnumbered by the millennials, the cohort born after 1980. They're now 90 million strong in North America. That's a generation that many of them grew up in the suburbs yearning for the city. They're the ones who have arrived not only Brooklyn and Oakland and Montreal's plateau, but they're also making a go of it in smaller cities like Pittsburgh and Saskatoon and Cincinnati. The millennials are far less interested in car ownership than their predecessors. Amazingly, about half of American teenagers now say they'd rather have internet access than own a car. 
that's a huge change. I was obsessed when I was 16 with getting my license. It was all Jack Kerouac and Bruce Springsteen back then. It's completely changed. <laughs> dates me. Many actually prefer getting to school or work by subway, buses, or streetcars, mostly because they can get a lot of reading, texting, and tweeting done. They use Google Maps to plan trips across the city and an app to find out exactly, and you can do this here in Edmonton, I'm happy to say, when the next bus or streetcar is coming. In other words, the millennials are instinctively multimodal, as the urbanists say, and an increasing number of them, while they might use a car from time to time, are saying that they might not ever own one. There's another reason that this whole strap hanger thing has legs, so to speak. Infrastructure in Canadian cities, and I see this almost every day in my hometown of Montreal, is collapsing. It's really bad out east. I had to, I had to take a bus over this thing on the way to the airport. That's the Turcotte, the notorious Turcotte interchange in Montreal. They're currently rebuilding it. They're talking about rebuilding the Gardner in Toronto. This is providing cities in Canada with a golden opportunity to reboot with transit in mind. At the same time, there's a new generation of politicians in Toronto, here in Alberta's cities, um, Montreal's plateau. One big obstacle remains. We've got a federal government that only contributes to tragic transit projects on an ad hoc basis. I heard the infrastructure minister boasting that the federal level had committed, had spent $7 billion on transit since 2006. Let's put this in perspective. Germany, which has twice our, only twice our population, spends 8 billion euros a year on transit, federal to municipal levels. Canada already has astonishingly high levels of transit ridership. In other words, we already have public buy-in. With reliable funding from the feds year in, year out, Canada's transit systems would be the envy of the world. There's an ethical case that I always like to make for transit too. The reality is, in North America, for one reason or another, because they're too young, too old, or have some kind of disability, 30% of people can't drive. That means almost one in three people are excluded from the dominant transportation system on this continent. I think anybody who's going into transportation or planning should be forced to spend a week negotiating their own city with a wheelchair or a stroller to see how many impediments to mobility there really are. I see them all the time in Montreal, especially pushing around Desmond in a stroller or putting on the back of my bike. Until then, an obvious question presents itself. Where do you start? How do you start transforming your own city? How do you get people thinking about streets as places where lovers can stroll, friends can stroll, rather than as thoroughfares for cars, the realm of traffic engineers? Perhaps the easiest thing I saw in all of my travels was something they did in Bogota. It was something called Ciclovia. And they started in the 1990s. It paved the way for <clears throat> the transmillennial system. It changed people's attitudes towards the streets. Every Sunday for the whole day, and on every major holidays, they closed down hundreds of kilometers of streets to traffic. And it was amazing to say the way that people just poured into the streets and said, hey, wait, there's all this space in our city that we could be using as public space. They've realized this in New York. Janet Sadat Khan has transformed Broadway and Times Square. She told me that there was all this pent-up demand for street space in New York. As soon as you pedestrianize something, people just poured in. They did it in Copenhagen with the Stroll, the longest shopping street in the world. All of these are extremely effective ways, symbolic ways, but effective ways, to remind people the city streets before they were thoroughfares for cars, were places where life was lived and children played. <clears throat> the New York Play Street from around 1910. So on my trip around the world, I saw all kinds of transportation vehicles. Maglev trains, bus rapid transit, light rail. Strangely enough, it was some of the simplest ones that really stuck with me. Here's one, the Mamachari, the mummy bike. They're all over Japan, all over Tokyo. People use them to carry their kids to school, to daycare. You can carry your groceries. It's part of a trip to the train station. Often they have two bikes, one in the city, one back home in the subdivision. They, they do part of the trip by bike and part by train. Here's another one. People don't think of this, but it's part of urban mobility. Those little cloth-lined urban uh, 
shopping carts or that you see all over Europe. There's one reason that people in Europe stay a lot fitter, along with apartment living, much later in life. Finally, here's one I'm hoping to use myself. My wife and I are expecting another child in March. I've sworn myself blue in the face that when this happens, we're going to get one of these things, one of these babies. <laughs> They're expensive. These are the SUVs of Denmark. <laughs> the Crown Prince owns one. You can carry three kids in some of the models, the, the nice ones like the Nihola, and uh, a week's worth of groceries. Obviously, none of these offer the high-tech glamour of a new light rail system or a bullet train. What they represent are partial solutions to the problem of mobility. But add up all these partial solutions and facilitate them with effective transit and more pedestrian and bicycle-oriented streets, and you start to get what's like a, what looks like a revolution, a revolution in mobility. After all, why go zipping around in a car if you actually like the place you live? Which is why I think everybody who considers him or herself an urbanist or planner should be asking him or herself one very important question. Why aren't we building ourselves streets and neighborhoods and cities that we want to linger in rather than escape from?